Hello, my name is Adam Montgomery. I'm an Niagara-based historian who is passionate about visiting and photographing the region's old cemeteries. Much of the history of the region over the past 200 years can be found by examining these sites and looking at the gravestones for those buried there. In this video, we're taking a short tour through Fairview Cemetery in Niagara Falls, looking at some of the stories and sites it contains. Let's get started. Fairview Cemetery was established in 1883 by a man named Morton Buckley, chair of a cemetery committee for the town of Niagara Falls. Like many large municipal cemeteries in the province, its creation was a response to key issues of the day, including a growing population, the need for more interment space after existing cemeteries and churchyards began to fill up, and as a public space for citizens to visit deceased relatives and enjoy a Sunday stroll. When Buckley first purchased the land for Fairview from a farmer named Adam Shug, it comprised 23 acres. The first burial was for a laborer named Thomas Whitaker, who was born in Cumberland County, England, and died July 18, 1883 at the age of 56 from stomach cancer. As of 2020, the cemetery now sprawls across over 77 acres and contains well over 20,000 memorials. Not only do the grounds contain many exquisite stone memorials that make you feel like you're walking through an outdoor art museum, it also has many stunning old trees planted back in the 1880s by Buckley himself. One of the cemetery's most interesting design features is that its paths, which were designed for pedestrians and horse carriages, are all windy and circuitous. There isn't an entirely straight road anywhere in the cemetery, making it a great place to enjoy a winding walk full of history, beauty, and tranquility. Let's look at some of the interesting memorials. When walking old cemeteries, it's important to look closely at the inscriptions on the gravestones. Sometimes a monument that at first glance appears to be for an individual or family turns out to be for an entire organization or order. This granite monument is for Lodge 53 of the Independent Order of Odd Fellows, an offshoot of the Odd Fellows that was founded in 1819 in the U.S. state of Maryland. It was placed in 1919 to commemorate the Lodge's 50th anniversary in Niagara Falls. Among the Order's many activities was visiting the sick at home or in hospital, contributing to charities, and burying the dead. 19th century newspapers are full of death notices or obituaries describing the Odd Fellows' presence at funerals, and in some cases they even conducted the service. At the top of the monument we can see FLT, which stands for Friendship, Love, and Truth. On the side panels we can see several members commemorated who died overseas during the First World War from 1914 to 1918 and beyond. Private Robert Taylor died of wounds at a casualty clearing station on September 21, 1916. Sergeant Harry Harris was killed during the Battle of the Somme in October of the same year. Lieutenant James Muir was killed at Vimy Ridge in April 1917. And lastly, Joseph Edge was a member of the Canadian Railway Troops who died in February 1919 and is buried at Kirkdale Cemetery in Liverpool, England. One of the things that makes this memorial interesting is that the Niagara Falls Public Library has a picture from when the monument was first placed, allowing us to glimpse at both the past and present. Another touching collective memorial at Fairview is the Tissue Donor Memorial, located in a prominent spot on the grounds. As the name suggests, it commemorates those buried at Fairview Cemetery who were tissue donors. At the base of the main memorial, a smaller circular piece of granite states, To the citizens of Niagara Falls who in death gave life, the greatest gift of all. With respect and thanks, we remember them here. In the center is the Niagara Falls coat of arms which among other things has a representation of the falls themselves as well as a reference to the hydroelectricity they provide. Here we are once again lucky to have an image from the memorial's unveiling on October 17, 1990. Pictured here are then Niagara Mayor William Smeaton on the left and Brian O'Brien from the International Monument Dealers Association on the right. The Tissue Donor Memorial is always landscaped with beautiful flowers in the spring and summer and provides those walking through the cemetery a chance to reflect on the selfless act undertaken by those it commemorates. 
Another example of community spirit at Fairview Cemetery is the Red Maple Garden, a section of the cemetery planted with red maple trees in 2009. One tree has a plaque at its base that describes its planting in 2008 and dedication by the Niagara Falls Chinese community to commemorate the cemetery's 125th anniversary, as well as the Chinese people buried there since its founding. The Qing Ming Festival, sometimes called Tomb Sweeping Day in English, occurs in China every year on April 4th, 5th, or 6th during one of the solar terms of the traditional Chinese solar calendar. During this festival, which has been held for over 2,500 years, people go to the cemetery and clean the tombs of their ancestors, plant flowers, leave food offerings, and sometimes burn artificial money to honor them. Since Niagara is quite cold at the beginning of April and flowers can't be planted, the Niagara Falls Chinese community marks the day every first Sunday in June. The Red Maple Garden has a traditional Chinese gateway arch, and inside are more than 200 burial lots where members of the Chinese community are buried. The trees planted around the section make it one of the most colorful and beautiful spots in the cemetery. They also show how cemeteries, which are often associated with death, can be places of vibrant life. Let's turn now to some examples of memorials for individuals and families. Another very interesting memorial at Fairview is this zinc grave marker for the Lewis family. What makes this memorial so fascinating is that unlike the stone memorials in the cemetery, it's made of zinc, is hollow inside, and was manufactured by the White Bronze Company of St. Thomas, Ontario. This company was itself a subsidiary of a firm in Bridgeport, Connecticut called the Monumental Bronze Company. Throughout the 1880s until the First World War, the Monumental Bronze Company and its Canadian subsidiary utilized local agents to sell their monuments, which they called white bronze. Customers picked their monument from a catalog containing many different designs, then the monument and inscription panel for the deceased were precast and sent from the factory. As other family members died, more inscription panels were ordered from the company, or in some cases, people sought out local craftspeople to measure and make panels which looked similar. This latter option was the case for Anna and James Lewis. We can see from their dates of death that they both passed away after the company had already went out of business. At some point, a family member or friend added this panel which, as you can see, is different in color and looks to possibly be made of bronze. Advertised as being impervious to weather and age, many of these monuments have indeed held up well and look almost as good as they must have when they were first made. This durability often makes people wonder, why didn't more people buy them then? The best answer historians have been able to come up with is that despite their durability, many people saw zinc grave markers as cheap imitations of stone and chose the more expensive white marble if they could afford it, or later granite, which also holds up a long time and was more in fashion. When you walk through the cemetery, see if you can find this rare and interesting example of one company's attempt to change the memorial industry. The next memorial I wanted to show you is this one for Vincenzo Moraldo and his wife Maria Luminaco, who both passed away before the mid-20th century. Their gravestone is a beautiful example of memorial artwork done in granite. At the top is a crucifix, and then in the center are the gates of heaven opening with a dove flying inside. Doves are symbols of peace and the Holy Spirit, and this motif of the gates was inspired back in the late 19th and early 20th century by an 1868 best-selling religious novel called Gates Ajar by Elizabeth Stuart Phelps. The gates ajar became a popular motif in funerary floral arrangements and on granite gravestones, and I've seen examples dating all the way up to the mid-20th century, each with its own slight variations. Here I've included an example of another gates ajar stone from Chalmers Presbyterian Church Cemetery over an hour's drive away from Fairview in Haldeman County to show you just how widespread the design idea was. The last memorial is for George Rigg and his wife Esther Beamer Rigg. George was born in 1874 or 1875 and died in 1944. Esther was born in 1880 and died in 1962. Their memorial has the Bible on top and in the middle has bronze gates opening, signifying their entry to heaven. It's another example of how the previously discussed gates ajar motif stimulated many different monument designs that included gates opening for the deceased. 
George was born in St. Thomas, Ontario, and came to the Falls sometime in the 1890s. He and his brother Edward began a monument business there in 1897, and the building they occupied on Queen Street still stands. The company was first bought by Mooney Monuments, and then in turn bought by Kirkpatrick Monuments, another longtime memorial firm in Niagara that began operating in 1929 in Font Hill. A photo from the Niagara Falls Public Library with an unknown date shows the building when it was still named Rigg Memorial Works Limited. The Rigg name can still be seen on old monuments across the region. Here I've included a memorial from Zion Cemetery in Fort Erie that has the words Rigg and Niagara Falls in short form on its bottom right corner. Another interesting photo from the Niagara Falls Public Library shows what is thought to be the inside of the Rigg factory. The exact date is unfortunately unknown, but it's certainly from the early 20th century judging by the fashion the men are wearing. Here we can see wonderful details of workers in various stages of monument production. By this stage in history, most monument makers were no longer part of a craft industry, and instead were often members of firms with several or more workers, sometimes with offices in different locations. This photo gives a rare glimpse into the making of monuments and is the only photo of the inside of a Niagara monument factory I've seen. I hate to cut it short when there is so much more to talk about from Fairview Cemetery, but there's simply too much to pack into one video without making it very long in duration. I hope this first video has made you want to visit and find some of the monuments discussed here. Join us for the next video, coming soon, as we look at a prominent black musician from Niagara Falls, a woman from the Royal Canadian Air Force who sadly died in 1942, and many other interesting stories and memorial designs from around the cemetery. Thanks to the Niagara Falls Museum for commissioning the video, to the Niagara Falls Public Library for use of their great photos from Niagara history, and to you, the viewer, for watching. Music